Good afternoon, good morning, and good day, friends, colleagues, and to all our dear participants. Welcome to Shaping Sustainable Futures Together series. This series is organized by the Baliwag University in cooperation with the University College of Estate Management and Global Sustainable Futures. We are about to begin the first session of the series. I am Ramadan D.C. De Jesus, the Senior High School Principal of Baliwag University and your moderator for this session. Once again, we welcome you to Shaping Sustainable Futures Together series. Thank you for being with us in this event. Before we begin, may we ask everyone to follow these Zoom meeting guidelines. Kindly use your complete name as your Zoom account name. You may include your institution or affiliation in your name. Please keep yourself on mute. And if you have a question, you may type it in the chat room and share your ideas as well. Furthermore, we would like to remind everyone about the following. First, Shaping Sustainable Futures Together series is comprised of six online events or short workshop events. The six online events will take place on the third Friday every month from November 2021 to April 2022. At the end of the six online events, each participant will receive Certificate of Participation in Shaping Sustainable Futures Together series. Evaluation of the activity will be done before ending the program. To formally start this series of sessions, let us listen to the welcome remarks of the dynamic and innovative president of the Baliwag University here in the Philippines. Let us all welcome Dr. Patricia Bustos Lagunda. Dr. Pat? Yes. <laughs> okay. I'm unmuting myself. So, good afternoon to everyone. On behalf of the Board of Trustees and the administration of the Baliwag University here in the Philippines, let me extend a very warm virtual welcome to all present in today's Shaping Sustainable Futures Together series. As mentioned earlier, this is a series of six learning sessions to be held every third Friday of each month from November this year to April 2022. It's so heartening to know that we have so many participants from all over, from Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. And I, you also see some names of school or university presidents. Thank you, thank you for joining us. This online series is a brilliant idea resulting from the cooperation among the University College of Estate Management in the UK, Global Sustainable Futures Network, the OPEDUCA or OPADUCA project, and Maastricht University in Netherlands. We are happy that Baliwag University plays host to this webinar series with as much pleasure as when we hosted the International Virtual Research Conference last August 5 and 6, 2021. Sustainable development is everyone's responsibility. It has become the catchphrase for international aid agencies, the jargon of development planners, the theme of conferences and academic papers, as well as the slogan of development and environmental activists. This is according to Ukaga, Masser, and Reichenbach. But what its precise definition and dimensions are as it impacts our individual context remains to be articulated and tackled in more detail. Hence, we are delighted that this free webinar series will provide an avenue to further our knowledge, awareness, and level of action on our respective roles to promote sustainability for, from various societal sectors involving scholars, university students, school leaders, governmental policy developers, managers from mid-scale and larger industry, as well as NGOs. The pillars of sustainability, including human, social, economic, and environmental, need our deliberate efforts of action in order to meet our present needs without compromising the ability of the next or future generations in meeting their needs. 
It must happen without depleting the capacity of the natural environment to meet present and future needs. Through this series, we hope to contribute to the intelligibility and articulacy of the discourse on sustainable development by providing more concise information on its meaning, evolution, associated key concepts, dimension, the relationships among the dimensions, the principles, and their implications for global, national, and individual actions in the quest for sustainable development. This is significant as it would provide researchers, policymakers, and academics, as well as development practitioners and students more information about the paradigm for policymaking, decision-making, and further research. The delivery team, Baliwag University's visiting fellows for global sustainability, will provide our participants with action-based perspective, envisioning the empowerment of participants to take an active role in shaping a sustainable future. They will be formally introduced later on after my short message. With this, I enjoin everyone to complete the six webinars. It's just one, you know, one and a half hours of, uh, of your time every third Friday of the month. And learn sustainable practices in order to promote balance between the environment, economy, and equity. Critical two is a full understanding of what sustainability is all about. So please stay with us for the next five learning sessions. This, today we have introduction to sustainability and you will see the other topics in the poster that we sent to you, all six of them. In closing, I wish all of us a productive and meaningful webinar series and together let's have a sustainable future. Thank you very much and stay safe everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Patricia Lagunda, our university president. Thank you for your wonderful message to the participants and for explaining to us what we can expect in this series. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, we will proceed to the introduction of the BU Visiting Fellows for Global Sustainability and members of the delivery team. They will be introduced by Dr. Francia R. Santos, Country Coordinator for the Philippines, Global Sustainable Futures. Dr. Franz? Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ramadan. So I am very pleased to introduce to you the Visiting Fellows for Global Sustainability. So here are the members of the delivery team. So we have the founder of Global Sustainable Futures Progress through Partnership Network to achieve sustainable development agenda 2030 and beyond. So she is providing a collaborative platform for innovative and transdisciplinary partnerships and capacity development for early career researchers. So she's being joined by the senior experience researchers from Global South and Global North. Dr. Renuka Thapor believes in broader sustainable development concept and uses multidimensional lens of sustainability innovations and theoretical trainings to address the problems of societal systems and propagate these through the various activities, research, teaching, and practice towards achieving global sustainable goals. She is using systems thinking engagement and active multiple stakeholders for effective governance. So let us all welcome Dr. Renuka Thakur. So she's here. The next um, member of the delivery team is a lecturer of sustainable development and climate change from Maastricht University. So he is an economist, CFO, CEO, a social entrepreneur, leading the RCE Ryan Muse. So the first of 174 regions worldwide, binding together the knowledge and action of industry, education, science, regional governments, and societal institutions for the realization of education for sustainable development. So he is the lead of the Opeduka project. 
an ongoing strive to realize the transition of formal education towards transdisciplinary learning. Okay, so there's a lot more to be introduced about Opeduka project. Okay, so can we have now uh, the third member of the delivery team? So I am honored to introduce to you, Mr. Ku Hat Aung. Uh, provides his providing sustainability related advisory services for the agriculture forestry project development and management, incorporating remote sensing applications for precision agriculture utilizing drones, UAVs or the unmanned aerial vehicles into standard plantation farm operations. He has been involved in establishing integrated oil palm and other crop plantation farms downstream processing and agriculture trading activities. So he has a lot of achievements and he's also providing advisory for environmental management of conservation projects. He is uh, right now involved in implementing community waste management programs promoting agricultural waste and municipal solid waste conversion technologies. So um, Mr. Ku Hak On graduated with a Bachelor of Science Agribusiness from the University Putra, Malaysia. So let's all welcome the convener for Global Sustainability Summits and Dialogues, Global and ASEAN Green Chamber of Commerce. Visiting fellow, Mr. Ku Hak On. So with that, let's all welcome the delivery team, the Baliwag University Visiting Fellows for Global Sustainability. So a pleasant day to all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Franz. Dr. Inuka, go ahead, ma'am. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here. And I'm very grateful to Belugia University, the president Patricia Leg Legunda and uh, the head of the school Ramadan, the Jesus and Dr. Francio, my network coordinator. She is wonderful. And I'm also very pleased to welcome my colleagues and say thank you. I'm grateful to them too, who the uh, Ku Hok An and Professor uh, Joss Hussein, who are going to join me throughout this series. So thank you very much and welcome to all of you. Let us be a part of Sustainable Futures as Patricia mentioned. So let us start our journey. Thank you. I would like to share my slides now. Dr. Inuka, will you be sharing your slides or do you want us to do it for you? Uh, no, please share the slides for me. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Mabana. Yeah, can you put it on the slideshow? Yeah, thank you. So here I am. Uh, can we go to the second slide? Yeah. Uh, I'm very thankful to all the organizations who have provided in-kind support for this workshop series. Next, please. So as already it has been announced, this first series or first session of this series is Introduction to Sustainability. Thank you. Next, please. And in this workshop, we will cover climate change and climate science, historic development of the concept, sustainable development, and current discourse of sustainability. Thank you, next. So the purpose of this first section is to provide background on climate change, but it may not be a comprehensive over, like it is only a comprehensive overview and um, we, we will, sorry, it's not 
total everything, but we will provide you a snapshot uh, that offers you a window that how this issue and the scale is wide and deep and uh, very challenging. And it is crisis to the scale of crisis. And later in the third section, we will provide you options which will be led by who, and he will be providing you more on how the humanity or how we can address these incoming decades. We end here to present the whole factual, uh, broad account of climate change. And it is important to bear here in mind that climate data is changing all the time and it is updated and therefore after one year, if you revisit this, you may find that few facts are old. So just bear in mind that this is uh, true in the present current position. Okay, thank you. Next, please. So climate change. We hear it so much that it feels like a buzzword now, but it is far from that. Climate change is real and serious issue. But you may wonder, isn't the climate not always changing? Then what exactly is climate change and why should we care? Climate change is a reality and the extent and speed of it becoming more evident. You must have experienced the temperatures that are increasing, rainfall patterns are shifting, sea iron glaciers and snow are melting and sea levels are rising and droughts are there uh, uh, without any uh, timings. So while climate change is only a relative recent public concern, it has been known that it is scientific circle, it has been known into scientific circles from longer time. Scientists, for example, Unique Food and John Tynell, knew the heating oceanoga uh, like heating potential of an atmosphere heavy in carbon dioxide as early as 1850 and by 1950 oceanographer Roger Ravin was briefing the United Congress United States Congress on the issue and lobbying to fund to build an atmospheric carbon dioxide monitor monitoring station uh, in Hawaii. So evidence support that these early theories and findings have been building ever since. Thank you, next. So well, the Earth's climate has changed throughout the history. Most of these has been slight changes and they are caused by small variations in the Earth's orbit as shown here. But over 95% of scientists agree that humans cause climate change. Humanity's accelerating burning of fossil fuels and deforestations. Forests are key parts of the planet's natural management resources. And therefore they have led to rapid increase of carbon house, uh, greenhouse gases on, in the atmosphere and impacting on global warming. So today we are experiencing human made global warming and the temperature rises are becoming noticeable. Next please. Next. Yeah, so for climate change, we know it today is characterized by an abstract in, ab abrupt in, in increase in the earth's temperature is estimated to have gotten by 1.2 to 1.4 degree Fahrenheit warmer in just the last century. 10 out of last 13 years were warmer on the record. And 97% of climate scientists agree that new tendency is not caused by the variation of the Earth's orbit, but rather very likely by human activities. Humans build aeroplanes, faster cars, developed remarkable technology, and learned how the natural resources around us can be used for benefit of ourselves. And although this has led to many wonderful 
inventions and advancements and such as this laptop, which you are viewing or any device that you are using to view this workshop. Of course, there have been advances, but it has now limited our ability to take further due to the lack of natural resources. Yes, next please. So ice loss from Greenland and Arctic ice sheets is already contributing to sea level, sea level rise. And the unstable retreat of some Antarctica and Greenland glaciers may further accelerate sea level rise and possibly abruptly. Mass loss from the Greenland, Greenland ice sheet could be irreversible in the foreseeable future. Risk of biodiversity loss and extinction increase greatly both for terrestrial and marine species as warming increases with large increase of warming levels between 1.5 and 2 degrees uh, centigrade and further increases in rise beyond 2 degrees centigrade warming. So ocean warming, acidification and deoxygenation Para, per, permafrost to degradation and the extinction of the species are some phenomena that are highly relevant to human societies and ecosystem integrity, but as effectively irreversible on centuries time scale. Next, please. 2.5 billion years ago in the Prothesoric era, the kinobacteria or the blue algae completely reworked the planet's atmosphere, giving the oxygen rich air we breathe today. Another important change happened after the retreat of Ice Age glaciers, where the Earth entered a warm, wet, and climatic stable period that geologists all call Holocene after about 10,000 years ago. The Holocene has been a good time for human civilization to emerge and thrive. The seasons have been pretty regular, moving between regular, uh, relatively mild boundaries of hottish and coldish. The transition was the key change and allowed humans to get stable and productive agriculture started. But the civilization began and the Holocene came to an end. That's where the thing gets interesting and where the Anthropocene makes first entrance. Scientists now recognize that our impact on Earth has become so significant. We have, we have pushed it out of the Holocene into the Anthropocene an entirely new geographical uh, epoch dominated by our own activities. And there are many reports on these, for example, Andy Revin's report on Anthropocene. And it's not just about climate change. Human beings are now colonized more than 50% of the planet's surface and we drive flows of key planetary substances like potassium far away from the natural levels. So here I mentioned, uh, um, yeah, all right, that's fine, thank you. And uh, next please. So that's where the things get interesting and where the Anthropocene makes the entrance Scientists now recognize that our impact on Earth has become so significant that we have pushed it out of Holocene. We are witnessing a sixth mass extinction event with an estimated 150 species in seeing every day. Across Earth history, there have been five precious mass extinction events all resulting in catastrophic biosphere and geosphere changes, while also giving rise to new species 
in the aftermath. Indeed, we can observe a kind of yin and yang between origin and extinction rather than being a constant gradual evolution of life. Instead, consists of the periods of stability as well as a sudden upheaval. Unlike other planets, we know Earth has surface and atmosphere conditions that are influenced and determined by a complex biosphere. Plants and animals revolve, evolving together maintain a careful balance of nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and other gases and keep the planet at a relatively stable temperature and in conditions that support our life. What all mass distinction events, uh, extinction events have in common is a major devastating for the biosphere, geosphere and atmosphere with changes in one having impact on the other. The extinction event is currently underway is unique in that, that it is driven by the actions of humankind, human species. Overfishing, deforestation, expansion of agriculture, air and water pollution, all are having an effect. Climate change is exacerbating all of these factors. Next, please. It also means that we have increased our consumption of natural resources and in turn released a lot of carbon gas, carbon greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Now greenhouse gases occur naturally, but in excess can be dangerous to our planet. Modern human activities have increased the release of non-natural occurring greenhouse gases. Because we have stepped on our demand for burning fossil fuels, the composition of greenhouse gases trapped heat radiated from the sun. And the more heat they trap, the warmer the planet becomes and it gets warmer and warmer and we, become, we begin to feel the effects. Next, please. So to so to understand why, what is the case, why that is the case, we need to look at the relation between greenhouse gases and the temperature. There are two main culprits driving climate change right now, carbon dioxide and methane. Both trap heat in the atmosphere and indeed we depend, them, we depend upon them keep to keep the Earth's uh, surface temperature warmer rather than a Fiji, that is minus 18 degrees centigrade. However, in the last 20, 120 years, uh, this, the concentration of both these gases in the atmosphere has shoot up to unprecedented levels and global average temperatures have risen as a result. And these, there are links given here. Please feel free to explore them further later. Next, please. Although we had the COVID-19 pandemic just two years now, and they have laid, and in 2019, uh, 2020, actually they laid to unprecedented uh, decrease in carbon emissions, which is like 5.4 percentage of drop in CO2 emissions. However, a strong rebound on these climate emissions is ex will be experienced as we move towards the regular economy. Next, please. So the richest 10% accounted by 52% 50, uh, of global CO2 emissions. So the richest countries contribute to carbon emissions by 52% of the global carbon emissions are contributed by these richest uh, countries. 
And that is striking that the world's richest uh, 1% were also more than double the emission of the poorest half of the humanity, which is represented by 3.1 billion people. And this is, uh, these are the emission counts between 1990 and 2015. So these statistics highlight how the burden of reducing emissions should be spread equally. It is also important to bear in mind that consumption levels are spreading rapidly across and within different countries. It is estimated that the global medium class, middle class exceeded half the global population in 2018. So in the emerging economics like India, Brazil, and China, we are seeing demand for formerly luxury, uh, for, uh, luxury consumer goods, cars, and meat-based uh, diets, which show no stop signs of stopping. So of course, in this inherent in how human nature to strive and more especially there are examples around here. And from South Africa and South Africa, from India to Australia, all around the world, younger generations are striving for the best mobile phones, fastest car, and most expensive clothes. And this is all adding to our carbon emissions. Here, what determines the level of C? And I believe uh, there is a video link here. And I, sorry, next. Yeah, and there is a video link here in the this, but we will not play here due to the lack of time. We will allow you to uh, explore that video link at your own. So next, please. And the release of carbon emission, methane and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere is one of the part of the story. But the highest culprit of these carbon emissions is ocean. Ocean absorbs more carbon and it becomes acidic and which in turn reduces the ability to hold oxygen. And that impacts everyone in ocean. It gets warmer and becomes less efficient. Year by year, oceans are getting hotter. And here, this, uh, there is also a link attached to this picture uh, which will take you to further reading and details. So I won't go into details. However, it is important to understand that the causes of these changes are down more to CO2 and simply cutting climate emission is also not going to help because we, are go we need to build on the lost biodiversity. And therefore we need to lessen the exploitation of our resources. And that we will come later, uh, we will talk these things in detail later. Yes, change please. And this year there is a reaction which is showing uh, ocean acidification and it shows that direct increased, uh, uh, direct link of Increased atmosphere CO2 is rapidly changing the seawater chemistry. And again, as I said, I won't go into the details, but you have here a chance to deep into the chemical equations here to know further. Thank you. Next. One of the impact is very important to mention here, coupled with the rising temperature is coral reefs. Annihilation of uh, coral reefs, and they it, they are at the stage where ninety percent of incredible diverse and beautiful underwater uh, waters have vanished from the face of planet. Regardless of any step we are, we will be taking here, we will find them that they are lost, and so it is. Yet the ocean's uh, immensity and depth comes to illusion and evolution and illusion that the scientists are still very crucial here that they cannot 
give any justice to this problem. Next, please. And the climate change, be, uh, as I already said, biggest victim are oceans. And one of the consequences of this is that the surface uh, acidification is there, and that is also increased by 30% since 18th uh, century. And 3 billion people in the world rely on the wild catch and farmed seafood as a primary source of protein in sea. Approximately 3 billion people in the world uh, and, and therefore, the seafood industry has significant, magnificent uh, impact on the environment. Next. On the top of that, glaciers and ice sheets are melting. And this Antarctica, you know, you, uh, you climate change is now also impacting ice sheets and Antarctica and uh, ice, uh, the ice cubes like of about half a mile, half kilometer, they get melted in just few minutes. And it is uh, natural disasters like floods, torrentos and deadly heat waves and you cannot do anything. So scientists believe However, that on personal level, we can do something. We have to say, make small steps, such as walking in the streets, um, uh, not using uh, fuel, fossil fuel, and so on. And we will touch on this if uh, further in the series. Next, please. And thus I come to just uh, to the second session here, second section here, the historic view of sustainable development. Next. So there are different definitions. There are different definitions of sustainable development, but the most well known is development that needs meets the need of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And this definition was given by Brutland uh, and was developed or coined in the United Nations in 1987. Next, please. And here I will allow you to look at the YouTube video, which is from which is very interesting and it gives you a snapshot of sustainable development. And I, do, uh, I have a link here, but today I will not play that one. But I would like to say that this was motivated due to the population bomb in 1963 written by Paul Enrich. And, the, uh, and that made people think that if we are forecasting this population growth, what are we going to do to feed them? And if we are feeding them, we will need more resources and therefore it will then impact our climate and our uh, natural resources. And another book, which is very important and groundbreaking report, sorry, not book, report, is limits to growth. And that is very important. And, uh, 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 you, you would ex I will leave you to explore these things further. Next, please. The attendance. Uh, yeah, okay. The attendance of the theme of sustainable development is comparatively young. And it wasn't uh, widespread, but this report, Our Common Future, made it reback into the society and made people think. Next, please. Uh, yes. The world community began to realize that the concept which we are doing with sustainable development, which was like economy slash development, but that is not going to work. And we need economy and development. And therefore, following that, 
We also realized that there was a need of social inclusion. And we oh, later, for many years, we had economic and social two pillars only. But later on, we also realized that without having our environmental limits to deliver our objectives of economy and social development, we are not going to thrive. And therefore, please click again. We have the third pillar, which makes three pillar, uh, uh, three, three bottom pillar here, uh, uh, which is also, which is economy, environment, and social. Next, please. So many countries promise to work on the objectives of reducing carbon emissions. However, uh, there were some, um, this, for this uh, social pillar, uh, Kohi Anand, who, who, who wrote a book which was called We the People. And this We People, uh, it, it came into policies, like it was adopted into policies for social policies. Secondly, in 2002, Johannesburg, the World Summit on Sustainable Development had two important things. And they were like one, advance and strengthen the inter interdependence and mutually enforcing pillars of sustainable development. So we have to think of three pillars together whenever we are having a, a development policy. And also it led to 2005, the World Summit where we, so next please. Uh, yeah, so here, um, yeah, I will continue the, uh, uh, Millennium Development Goals in the next uh, uh, slide. But here it is important, no, so just go to the uh, previous slide, please, yes. So another very important outcome of Johannesburg was to involve a set of actors, which was to promote private public party uh, partnerships and increasingly the international development. And after 20 years, they had these, uh, they met and negotiated the rules and extended this concept of multi-stakeholders partnership for governance and implementation of sustainable development. And in this series, you will find several examples on these later on. So as a result, there are numerous voluntary commitments that were made during the summit and was particularly interesting that this was uh, in many ways, so the precursor of sustainable development goals also. So next slide, please. So in 2005, the World Summit, which finally ha held and uh, it was 189 uh, countries began working on millennium development goals. And uh, here they made a progress for last 10 years. And uh, uh, within uh, several things, uh, there were uh, progress, such as 39% uh, of child mortality was reduced, 15% uh, 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 yeah, uh, the people living, sorry, people living in uh, poverty of $2 a day was reduced by 39% and the child mortality was reduced by 15%. However, the progressive steps were made for greenhouse gases still we were not able to control them. Next. So there was considerable talk about what would replace this millennium development goals. And therefore, when it expired in 2015, we came up with this sustainable development goals until the agenda, like which we are called 2030 agenda. So the sustainable development goals have a new action plan to address 17 different goals. And these icons, they represent 17 different goals. And I have put a website here. Uh, and if I've not put, I will put the link. You, 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 and it is also on uh, publicly available on UN. 
and you are free to you i i would definitely ask you to go and explore this website and understand each and every goal which are very interesting to know that what challenges we have if we are looking forward to deliver the common objective of common good next please so this agenda, as I already mentioned, has 17 goals, but it also has within that 169 targets, and it is for 15 years, and all countries and all stakeholders have joined here. However, the fundamental crucial part of this 2030 agenda is this six, uh, uh, five, no, six, one, two, three, four, five, uh, five piece. And these piece are uh, for, first is for poverty reduction. Second one is for planet. That means we have to protect the planet. The third one is prosperity. So even if we are looking at decreasing the in carbon emissions, we must not forget that we are here to prosper. We must make, keep on moving our economic growth. But with the, within our sustainable limit. So with uh, making it sustainable within our environmental limit. And the fourth P relates to peace, which is very, very important. Uh, because without peace, no society can strive, no society can become just and inclusive. And therefore, and the final P is about partnerships. Without, taking partnership and here today you are looking a classic example of partnership between us and without partnership we cannot do any collaborative work or uh, work that is needed for our common good next please so while these concepts of common good and bringing everyone together and sharing uh, responsibilities have been discussed uh, there is there are several particular approaches also being proposed but this one particular approach is very interesting that it allows us to estimate how the different control variables of seven boundaries have changed within from 1950 to present and why we should keep into this green circle why should we be doing all our activities keeping our impacts within just green circle you can see that we are doing several things which are unlimited and unsustainable, and therefore we should be changing our uh, actions. Now, alongside giving, uh, sorry, next please. So alongside, they, uh, they have uh, been given, uh, a, they have given a substance to the responsibility uh, of this science. Uh, to one of the panel, which is called Inter International Panel of Climate Change. And this was established in 1989. And the organizational function of this uh, IPCC uh, established by UN is a neutral scientific research institution. And this office is situated in uh, Switzerland. And they work with thousands of scientists throughout the world. And it is quite unique that they are neutral authority and therefore uh, they can influence many governance. And uh, like, so it is other way, the people from govern government and other authorities look towards them or believe them to uh, provide the facts and therefore they, they uh, adopt these facts to develop their policies. Next, please. Alongside the development on the concepts and theoretical underpinning to achieve sustainable development goals, concrete actions for sustainable consumption and production is needed. And this was uh, introduced through Coeto Protocol an international treaty that seeks for reduction of carbon greenhouse gases that contributes to global uh, warming by setting uh, emission reduction targets. 
to for the industrial nations. And this Kyoto Protocol was um, signed by 119 countries. Next, please. And following that, after many years, uh, the Paris Agreement was legally binding international treaty on climate change. And it, adopted, it was adopted by 196 uh, parties at COP21 in Paris on 12th December. And it was, the goal was to limit global warming and well below two, uh, two degrees, preferably 1.5 degrees Celsius. And, out, out, and there were many other outcomes of this Paris Agreement, which were very important, such as national adaptive adaptation plans were processed in many countries. The conference of parties invited parties or relevant organization and stakeholders to learn the outcomes and experience and lessons. And that led to the development of one uh, 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 web platform, which was called deforestation and forest degradation of developing countries. And another important uh, outcome of this Paris Agreement was nationally determined contribution, that is NDCs, and at the heart of Paris Agreement and the achievement of these long-term goals. So, uh, yeah, next please. And finally, we saw this COP26 summit brought parties together to accelerate action towards the goals of the Paris Agreement and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And on 13th of November, just a few days before, we had concluded the Glas uh, Glasgow COP26. And very interesting and significant outcomes came out of this COP26. So one was that they can reconfirm the centrality of sustainable recovery from COVID-19 and solicit the vulnerable parties to global efforts to tackle climate change. And uh, many other uh, outcomes were just like they they emphasized again their um, uh, 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 the action towards uh, keeping our, uh, uh, sorry, 0.5 uh, degree centigrade uh, promised to, uh, to um, remain uh, within 0.5 degree centigrade, but also many other things like uh, they increase the visibility of indigenous people, local communities, migrants, children within these actions. And so the main point was to lay down the responsibility on local communities. And, and that is why I think this series is also very important uh, in that sense that we are directly communi uh, communicating with the community to em emphasize this importance and uh, create awareness for climate change. And here I will stop and I will now uh, give the floor to Ku to continue with uh, section three. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Renuka. Will um, Francia, uh, your side, share the slides with, for me? Will it be possible or you like me to share the slides from, from my end? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Balak University and Dr. Renuka for arranging this particular session, uh, the part of which I will speak on the business perspective. Uh, this is the first of a series, and this is at the introductory level, Introduction to Sustainability. And thank you, Dr. Renuka, for giving the broad outline of the development of sustainability over the decades in the past uh, decades has affected our planet. In fact, I think the issue of sustainability goes back centuries, if not millennia, uh, of our human civilization. But I will provide the business perspective, uh, mostly because it is uh, part of my background. And I will be introducing this topic from a very hands-on, uh, on-the-ground approach, uh, if you don't mind. Thank. You. Uh, next slide, please. 
the, the content that uh, of my few slides that I have and the presentation I will provide is to discuss how sustainability, the topic of which we will talk about, impacts business. Uh, secondly, what are sustainability standards and practices which we hear about uh, these days? And thirdly, which will be uh, sustainability, what is in store for businesses going forward? So I, I've broken down my presentation into these three parts. I will go into the first part and to define what is green. Uh, I use the word green and uh, sustainability interchangeab interchangeably uh, because green is a more common term, uh, layman term, you can say. But uh, it has been known to be a modern day term for a movement which advocates for the interests of the earth, ecology, and the environment in its totality, inclusive of all the planet's inhabitants. But one, uh, and I must emphasize this, that often sees businesses as its adversary. So there's an adversarial situation here, which we must take note of. Green is regarded as synonymous with sustainability, as I have mentioned. And businesses in the last few decades, if not the last 10 years, especially, have been encouraged to understand, to implement, and to certify certain sustainable business practices. So they try to make businesses conform or try to achieve some degree of compliance. But this encouragement uh, has only been to uh, measure what businesses can do to comply with sustainability practices. And there is a spectrum of who does more or who does less. So I have put together, if you like, a continuum of uh, how businesses can look at sustainability. This is something that I've put together from my own experience. And as you can see on the left-hand corner is a color pink, it's not green. <laughs> so I start from that corner and that corner says, we are looking at negative corporate values whereby you have uh, outright misrepresentation, greenwashing taking place. Uh, I would call it bad business behavior. You are, the businesses are representing areas claiming that they are performing, but they're not actually doing it. Then slowly, uh, you have the yellow column, which is basically what I would classify as those companies or those areas where you have company-centric values, business as usual, if you see the arrow at the end, uh, when, and their behavior is motivated by profit maximization. So we have a situation where businesses carry on and they make money and um, they do not um, uh, care so much about the environment or social aspect so much. Then we have the start of uh, awareness of what is green. Uh, this is the first shade of my uh, various shades of green. You could have actually 50 shades of green if you like, but this is the first. And what we have is the product or process carbon diversity offsets or payment for ecosystems. Basically, a business carries on as usual. It does create pollution. It does have an impact on the environment. You have actually a carbon footprint, but what the businesses can do is look for carbon offset mechanisms or payment uh, for ecosystem services offset or biodiversity offsets. In other words, the businesses continue in their practice, but they look for ways to balance their environmental impact by looking for where others may have conserved forests or reduced the carbon footprint or uh, have arrangements where uh, payment for ecosystem services schemes are in place, which means if the environment, the natural forest provides water, air, good soil, biodiversity, diversity, this is maintained. But mind you, in this case, the carbon footprint impact of the business is still there. You have actually created a situation where you're only offsetting what you, have, you are doing. Then we have this concept in the next column of uh, becoming a little bit more green you have corporate social responsibility. This part of the business's aspect is that they try to produce reporting back to their uh, management, to their board of directors or to their shareholders or to their investors that they have done certain uh, activities that have 
made them responsible corporate citizens and that they are part of a community. But there's no real degree as to how this is measured, how this is compared. And you have actually some reporting systems uh, which are arranged by accounting firms and of course by PR agencies to give the company a good profile. Now, we enter three areas now which are considered sustainable practices. Environmental Social Governance, ESG, is an outgrowth of the CSR practice. This came about when stock exchanges around the world and investors needed to know whether companies were actually looking at the environment and social and governance matters in measurable ways. So essentially, this activity has to do with reporting. When you have a business uh, engaging in various uh, activities that might consider uh, waste management, for example, or uh, donations to underprivileged communities, then you have uh, aspects of this which are reported. And then you may have transparency. All, all these are reported. But there's no one yardstick or standard by which this is uh, actually measured. And I will refer to this later on. I'll be coming back to this continuum or this uh, table often because this is a very fundamental table. Uh, we have put together all the practices into one chart. And I don't think you can find such a chart easily in other presentations. The next is the sustainable development goals as Dr. Renuka had mentioned. And this is basically targets set up by governments as they have agreed at various conference of parties. And then I think this was developed in 2015. But these are very broad national objectives whereby you have um, countries working as a whole to try to achieve. Businesses have a role to play, certainly, but they are not expected to em embark on uh, solely any one of them or totally any one of them. The UN has created a UN Global Compact and various other instruments we wish to draw businesses in, but there's no compulsion here. Businesses are free to choose whether they want to or not to participate in this. The next level is industry voluntary standards or certification. Now this is interesting because this is a step towards greener um, practices. And this comes with uh, the requirement or the need of companies to have market access. The industry voluntary standards are usually multi-stakeholder arrangements, whereby industry, government, and the, and the uh, civil society get together, and they all agree, in other words, compromise on the expectations, and they set up standards by which they all agree. Now, these are all voluntary, not mandatory as yet. They all agree to comply to, for which, in return, they will get a opportunity to make a claim that they have adhered to such and such a standard. Now, at the very right side of the continuum, I have put a very deep green, and that's what I call the earth or ecocentric green business values. All these other values or all of these other practices that I've mentioned earlier are basically metric systems or measurement systems by which you can measure how far a company has actually tried to be sustainable. But the essence of a business is still operating. That is, it is to make a profit. And that it is, its primary goal is to maximize the interest of its shareholders. I think that's a very often quoted goal of management to maximize shareholder value. And this is what we have to bear in mind going forward. In the case of uh, eco-centric or earth-centric green business values, we'll be looking at perhaps formulating a different set of values. And this has come around to what is called maximizing stakeholder value, looking at stakeholders in a business, which may not be just the shareholders. We will discuss this in depth in the later uh, uh, workshops in the series. Next, please. So all businesses, I like to get back to basics, have to define what we call a system boundary. And a system boundary determines its incoming material and processing costs measured within that boundary. 
set against revenue streams from outgoing sales of products or services, thereby resulting in what we call, we normally call the accounting calculation of profit gain. So profit maximization requires that we treat all externalities outside the system boundary as free or without cost. And this includes environmental factors such as air, water, soil, and biodiversity. This may sound basic. Next slide, please. But it is basically fundamental to our treatment of what sustainability is from a business point of view. I'm sure many of you have seen the charts where you have uh, humanity or the man in red in the center and the rest of biodiversity surrounding it. And the white circle that you see is what you call um, the perspective of the man who is, which I call it egocentric. But what is, should be the case is to develop a sense of ecosentience and awareness of your ecology, whereby man is basically only part of the biodiversity and all the environment that he lives in. And that the system boundary really encompasses the entire of biodiversity and the environment or all of ecology. So we have to redefine our business system boundary. If you are a student in a business school, you'll be very used to calculating your profit and loss uh, within a little box, as we have mentioned earlier, but leaving society and environment outside the box. If you actually transition to what the true cost of a production is going to be like, you would have to include whatever in contributions the society has made towards your business and whatever the environment has made towards your business. A lot of businesses operate without calculating the true cost of its business, leaving out environmental and social uh, costs, which are actually borne uh, by other people and maybe borne by what we call future generations. And in that case, we are not presented with the true cost of the products and services that we consume every day. And this is the great distortion in our economic system that has created the intractable sustainability issues that faces us today. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. I'd like to look at uh, this topic of urban metabolism, which is basically an expression of how uh, the urbanization, urbanization of the world has taken place. Over the last two millennia, the level of urbanization has really grown in great degrees. Uh, by the year 2020, the world's percentage of the population is expected to reach 60 for urban population. And you can see from this graph that most of our population is actually centered in the major mega cities. And what's happening is that the inadequacy of urban planning, urban systems, and current levels of urban metabolization, which means management of our resources and waste systems in the urban area, uh, and the lack of ability to implement circular economy perspectives and a human habitat and to moderate corporate behavior has resulted in a lot of issues for us. Plastics issue, the plastics waste issue, pollution issue, uh, the pollution of our, of our environment in terms of our farming and agriculture. So basically, the concept that I'm trying to con convey here is that we have a natural planetary metabolism at work. We have humanity and we have the natural environment. Left to itself, the natural environment will know how to make use of its resources, process it, waste broken down by microbes and various elements of the nature, and then recycle back and reuse again. There are many cycles in our environment, the uh, water system, the air system, and all these work to great effect. But when humanity has made its footprint and imprint on the world, in such a great degree, there are great distortions. And I like to differentiate between what we call rural metabolism and urban metabolism. In the rural areas, the natural metabolism takes place unimpeded. But sometimes with human intervention in agriculture systems, you have um, situations where you have uh, exploitation. But the issue of urban metabolism is a very great one. And we do not have the tools and the means not the approaches to adequately deal with this, so that um, is the reason why we have issues in terms of 
sustainable existence or lifestyles in the urban environment. Next slide, please. One of the um, attempts has been to actually streamline value chains in industries. Um, I've been involved with the setting of standards for the biofuels industry. And gradually it became the biomaterials industry. Uh, in the 1980s, the World Wildlife Fund decided uh, to stop campaigning governments to have deforestation um, implemented or reduced. Instead, they decided to tackle or address the value chains around the world. And they started with the forest uh, industry. And so they developed together with other parties, the Forest Division Council or FSC, as you can see here. FSC is one of the oldest industry standards. Then gradually they moved on to all palm, the RSPO, the RSB. And then what we have now is a whole plethora of industry standards. There are 20 here. And all these have been set up and are members of the International uh, Social and Environmental Alliance. I was a member of the membership committee and we basically uh, graded uh, applicants who could apply. And basically they set standards for setting standard organizations. So what happens is these industries have developed these standards and they are all after what we call market access or better uh, uh, premiums that they can uh, command a better profit in the marketplace. And what happens is that these are all voluntary. There's no mandatory requirement, uh, but they would like to uh, be better than any mandatory requirement that is set. For example, biofuels in the US has a certain requirement of 50% uh, GHG savings over carbon sources. But the standard will set something like 75% savings if you can. So they try to achieve better standards. But this is still voluntary. And the jury is still out there as to how much of an impact they have into the industry itself in moving towards sustainability. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned earlier, and as Dr. Renuka has mentioned earlier, sustainable development goals are broad national goals and targets, but they have uh, no compulsion for businesses to apply them. They are aspirational goals for which businesses can choose which one they can embark in. It is very broad and it's very wide. Uh, there are social aspects like no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean wealth, clean water, and affordable clean energy, and so on. Number 10 is especially important, which is basically reduce inequalities, sustainable communities, responsible production and consumption, and then you have the environmental aspects, which is basically climate action, life below land, and life below sea. You can imagine if you are a business and you try to comply with any of these, it is like asking you to, you know, expand your system boundary to include every aspect of or every stakeholder that impinges upon your business. The general rule is that with every increase in concern over sustainability, it means increased cost for business. So the question is whether businesses can be commercially profitable or sustainable as a result. And that we have to examine in time to come. Next slide, please. What you have here now is the environmental, social, and governance practices. In the last few years, I would say the last two, three years, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen a surge in interest by the financial sector and in businesses for ESG practices. It is as if the financial sector woke up one day and found out that they cannot be left behind in this great area and era of concern uh, where humanity is really having to deal with climate change and many issues and that they'll be left behind if they do not, shall I say, jump on the bandwagon to um, meet the expectations of the public, the investment public, the consumer public and civil society in general. So ESG currently has three components, which is basically environmental, climate change, water, waste pollution, and biodiversity. Then you have the social aspects, health and safety, labor standards, which is basically whether you get fair wages or not, human rights and community impacts, 
demographics and consumption. Then you have governance, how the businesses are governed and managed, whether it's done with transparency, whether it's done with fairness for all the stakeholders concerned. And there are many issues here. Uh, when you try to transition from shareholder considerations to stakeholder consideration, because the stakeholders for a business can be very much wider than just the shareholders. Next slide, please. And this is my last slide. This sorry, second last slide. The COP26 conference last, held last week announced that the International Finance Reporting Standards Foundation, IFRS, uh, trustees have created a new board called the International Sustainability Standards Board. As I mentioned earlier, there are so many sustainability standards at the moment, a few thousand of them, and including um, ESG practices. There are many foundations and many bodies setting up their own standards. Uh, PRI is one, GRI is one, uh, Principle for Responsible Investment. Um, GRI would be Green Responsible Reporting. And then you have uh, Climate Disclosure Board and Value Foundations Report. There are many, many ones. If you do a Google search, you will be overwhelmed by the diversity of all these standards. So this is creating quite a problem because companies and stakeholders have struggled with so many standards and which one to use and which one not to use. So at least there's a first step at the COP26 conference, the Financial Reporting Standards Foundation have come together to create the International Sustainability Standards Board. And they will be setting up a technical committee with which they will um, work on this in the next year, 2022. And they will bring on board probably more accounting uh, standards board, including SASB, Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, and so many more. And then they will try to reconcile. And I think it will be a quite a bit of time until they agree on what to do. So I won't go too much into this because in future workshops, we'll cover more of this. And my last line goes to uh, redressing global wealth and income inequity. As you can see in one of the uh, SDGs, number 10, we have reduced inequalities as one of the goals. Central to any discussion on sustainability, in my view, is the vast global inequity in wealth and the and, and which is created by the power of their corporate enablers. While the freedom to amass great wealth is the default capitalistic system we have today, and is made possible by a deregulated framework with the imposition of limited choices on the impoverished of humanity by the capitalistic system is a fundamental drawback. What we are drawn into a stream of limited choices imposed by limited production systems, which have imposed on us by certain choices made by corporations, basically. Uh, for example, in the extractive industry, certain fossil fuel, uh, so that uh, they may make their uh, profit maximization as a core cornerstone of their corporate practice, find valuation in stock markets around the world. And, but this is a fundamental drawback of the economic system globally. While we have a very good uh, system, the free enterprise system for creating wealth, the system has a huge drawback in that it is fundamentally flawed in not being able to provide a wider and fairer distribution of choices for humanity at large. So in closing, we need to look at the capitalistic business model more closely. We need to look at its impact on global inequity and its causes, because this is one of the underlying causes of unsustainable actions and practices taking place in the world today. And we need to look at how we can develop remedial policy and action. There's a need for new novel funding systems and business models, new leadership options and outcomes. And with that, I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ku. And thank you as well, Dr. Inuka. Um, uh, thank you for providing us a very clear discussion about uh, climate change, sustainability, and you know, uh, the business perspective of sustainability also. So let me remind the participants that this is just the first of the six sessions in this series. If you learned a lot from them, expect that there will be more in the coming sessions. So at this juncture, we will proceed to the open forum.
We encourage our participants to take part in the open forum by sending your questions in our chat box. You may have your questions seen by everyone, or if you want, you may send it to me so I can address it to our visiting fellows for global sustainability. They have questions from our participants. This is your opportunity to ask. We have Dr. Renuka and uh, Mr. Ku. Again, let me mention, now while our participants are thinking of a question, uh, this is just the first of the six sessions. Later, we'll post the, the dates for the remaining sessions. Anyone from the group who would like to ask? Or uh, everything is clear, I think. Okay, so I have here a question. Uh, this is a private message, but let me read it. Uh, how can we reduce global inequity, especially in a third world country like the Philippines? How can we reduce global inequity, especially in a third world country like the Philippines? Mr. Ku or Dr. Inuka? Dr. Inuko, would you like to go first? <laughs> yes, sure, sure. Uh, uh, thank you for a very interesting question. Um, inequality is in many, many fronts, right? Uh, inequality in resources, inequality in natural resources, but also in our society. Inequality for women, gender, inequality for opportunities, inequality for, um, you know, opportunities for education, for employment, and many other things. Uh, and these are cultural, uh, and these are impacted due to our cultural, traditional way of societies. What I think that offering opportunities those who are able to offer opportunities, even if it is a small step. For example, here I am, and I offered an opportunity to Patricia and she engaged with me and she accepted. And we are having this wonderful experience of sharing our knowledge. So even sharing knowledge is one of the best way to move forward to decrease inequalities. and creating not only opportunities, but supporting people, give, uh, making some support mechanism to develop those capacities. And if we are developing our capacities, we will be able to address the challenges easily and change the world. Uh, initially, you might go back and look into 50 years where only one or two or few women uh, in uh, leaders were there. We used to talk about them, how they are, why they are there, and so on. But now it has become a common scenario. It is in mainstream. Though we, I, we have less, still, uh, we haven't reached that equality which we want to, but still we are moving. And therefore, I think more and more examples, more and more opportunities, sharing uh, things, will not affect your resources. That is the low, low income country here, especially what they have mentioned here that we do not have resources, but we do have resources to share, isn't it? And therefore I think we should be going towards that way. Sharing is the best practice here. Yeah, thank you. Ku, you can add something if you want, please. Yeah, I'd like to add, uh, this is a very important topic and I would love to cover more of this in the later sessions. But for now, I can probably give you only about three lines of an answer. <laughs> to me, the basic fundamental problem for inequality is uh, the failure of the capitalist system, capitalistic system to distribute wealth fairly. It has been very good at creating wealth. I must admit that, and we all agree. Free enterprise has allowed a lot of entrepreneurs and people who have the initiative to uh, develop their various uh, businesses, small enterprises, uh, but they actually suffer under an overall system uh, whereby you have monopolistic practices still taking place. And these monopolistic practices 
happen only because of corporate capture of um, governments and legislative bodies, whereby regulations and laws are made in their favor. And in that sense, and I say this boldly because this is happening all around the world, where you have so-called free enterprise at large. And there need to be a system of checks and balances whereby distribution uh, has to, of opportunities, not just of wealth, of opportunities need to be made. So this is the fundamental answer that I would give. The other thing is that uh, I think in most societies, especially maybe in the Philippines, we must make efforts to really eradicate poverty, which is SDG 1. And that's to reduce poverty by giving everybody basic levels of housing, income, uh, shelter, education, opportunities for uh, earning an income. If, if it's not wages through a salary, at least uh, a, a means with which they can um, provide uh, revenue for themselves. And this is where uh, either they are given uh, initiatives by the government or they develop initiatives by themselves and the environment is uh, favorable for them to do so. Um, that would be my two-part answer for addressing inequality. Uh, but I would like to elaborate on this in future workshops. Maybe Dr. Renuka, we can incorporate this because I think this topic requires a lot more attention because it's very fundamental to the area of sustainability. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ku and Dr. Renuka. We have someone who is raising his hand. Uh, Mr. Labaho, would you like to ask your question or would you like to say something? Yeah, uh, yeah good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Cesario Labaho from Jose Rizal University. Um, I am teaching right now a um, science, technology, and society, and one of our modules is about the sustainability. So we are integrating, um, like we are using systems thinking on uh, uh, on analyzing and synthesizing in different uh, issues, like here in the Philippines and also. Um, international like issues about uh, the the environment. So, like I have no questions right now, but I am asking if um, do you have some um, websites or like suggested website that we can get um, international articles or concept articles about the different issues, uh, uh, current issues about the environment right now. So that like, you know, um, I would like to use that one as resources in uh, one of my uh, topics in uh, using the systems thinking. Uh, I mean, like any suggestions or website that we can take some environmental issues internationally or locally here in the Philippines, if you have some. Uh, thank you, uh, Cesario Labazu. Uh, systems thinking is uh, very interesting to me. Uh, I have developed integrated systems thinking model for uh, resource efficiency and so on through my PhD. And I have one, uh, my talk on YouTube. So I will put that link, but you can also engage personally with me uh, to, uh, first of all, I will have to understand what you are looking for and maybe I will be able to help you out so you can uh, uh, engage with me. By that time, I will write down here the link to my YouTube video, which is on systems thinking and you can have a look. Yeah, I thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, we actually uh, just using the uh, one of the uh, tools and systems thinking and that is the causal loop diagramming. So I am using only that tool to, you know, to give the students uh, insights on the different. Uh, uh, yes, cause and loop is that one. for this yeah. link. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. cause and loop is uh, still okay, but uh, I look with uh, from the stakeholder engagement point of view, and therefore, that might be a bit interesting to you. Yeah, thank you so much for that one. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a, a question from Mr. Ricardo Lopez. What are the common ESG factors affecting business operations? Uh, I can answer that. Um, basically, when, when we break down the three, um, 
and it depends on which uh, areas of business you work on. Um, the ESG is actually covering such a wide swath of various business sectors from building and construction to manufacturing to financial to even agriculture and even to, um, to, 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 to distribution and retail trades logistics. So the most common uh, factor is basically social really because we have labor and we have uh, impact on, um, on, on health and all that. It starts with the EHS the environmental health uh, services part of the, of, the, of the companies first. Then later when businesses became more uh, uh, alert to the impact on the environment, I think in, environmental came in, especially all of them, especially the extractive and the agriculture industries. Governance factors has to do with a lot of transparency and, and, and um, how they deal with um, uh, issues of uh, corruption and uh, abuse of power and management and relationships with their shareholders or stakeholders. I hope Ricardo, I have answered these questions. These are the common ones. Uh, each, it, it differs from business to business. Uh, there are many reference points, too many to explain today. Maybe in one of our future workshops, we will summarize them all for you in a nice slide so that you can have a good, better look at it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ku. Another question, out of the uh, 17 scopes, concerns, or concepts of sustainability, uh, this is a question from Ms. Christel. Let me just read it. Uh, such as poverty, well-being, education, economic growth, etc. Which of those need to be prioritized in a resources-challenged country like the Philippines? Well, my answer is poverty. I think that's the first to uh, address. You must lift enough people out of poverty, then they can be enabled and empowered to be able to contribute. That's my first answer. I don't know, maybe Dr. Renuko might have another. <laughs> I believe uh, they are all integrated, isn't it? So just uh, focusing on poverty will not uh, do any much difference. Yes, it can do temporary difference by uh, changing the poverty, but we will then be impacting on environment and resources use as well, because poverty cannot be eliminated without resource use. And therefore we think we have to go for a uh, comprehensive way. Uh, it is also very uh, uh, strange for me sometimes when uh, national goals are decided on from the out of 17 goals. Actually, we must be looking at integration of all the goals and though there should be priority, but still uh, that, that priority can be the driver to achieve all the goals. And therefore we, we must look not as uh, addressing that, but taking that challenge as a driver and integrating other challenge uh, other goals as well as we go towards uh, achieving that goal. Thank you, Dr. Rinuka. We have a question from our participant from India, Tushar Pradhan. With regard to many sustainability standards, uh, the establishment of ISSB is a good move. Isn't sustainability seen in silos and worked upon until now? How do you see the standardization process to facilitate business to be more environment friendly? As their aim is profits at any cost, how would they be encouraged to work for global goals like SDGs, SFDRR, and Paris Agreement? Yeah, if I may, which is why I characterize, characterize all these efforts as compliance to expectations rather than coming from the businesses itself. I mean, left to their own, businesses will do business as usual. They will try to cater to shareholders' expectations and maximize profit. But because of um, the pressure from consumers, maybe their supply chain partners, the ecosystem from governments, from their investors, then they have to make uh, adjustments. And with that, uh, every adjustment that they make, they have to look at the costs that they have to bear in terms of businesses. So we get this all the time. You want to institute a new practice, it's a question of how much it costs. A friend of mine wants to put up a building and develop a green building uh, index for that building. Uh, we call it the green building index. So it costs an extra 500,000 US dollars to do that. So can the building manager or the building owner 
incorporate that cost inside? Is it worth it for him? When he sells the building uh, components to the buyers or the whole building itself, will it make a premium? So all these are the calculations that has to be made. Uh, so having said this, the question is really about standardizing this process. And in every industry, there are a lot of various criteria. It's basically along which lines, whose expectations are you trying to meet? In the case of ESG, the expectation is that of the investors. And so we have to see how this standardization process plays out to meet what they expect, uh, in, whether in, in terms of profit, uh, adjustment of their returns, uh, whether it's in terms of uh, the stakeholders that they will bring into play, uh, it's still yet to be seen out. I expect this working group to be working long and hard when they deal with all the other uh, standards, uh, ESG standards or the accountability standards to, to manage this. But it's still a process and it is in a process in the right direction. Uh, businesses have to acknowledge that there is actually a cost that they have to bear and they just may not be able to uh, profit maximize at the cost of the environment and of society at large. Thank you, Mr. Ku. Uh, we have a question uh, from Mr. Melvin Miranda. As nursing program managers, what could be the best way to integrate efficiently the concepts of SDGs in our curriculum amid the restrictions of their immersion in our communities? Dr. Renuka, maybe? <laughs> Uh, yeah, please say the sent, uh, uh, question again, please. Yeah, okay. Uh, this is uh, from, I think, uh, for nursing program managers. Now, what could be the best way to integrate efficiently the concepts of SDGs uh, for future nurses, probably, in our curriculum amid the restrictions? Yeah, uh, let me read the question properly. Uh, from whom is it? Uh, from uh, PNA Melvin Miranda, as nursing program managers, what could be the best way to integrate efficiently the concepts of SDGs in our curriculum amid the restrictions of their immersion in our communities? Uh, because I don't understand the exact question and that's why I'm struggling. Um, what, the, what is, can you send me here in my private message so I can get hold of it? Okay, so we'll ask for more details from Mr. Melvin. Ah, uh, yes, yes, I, I got it. What could be the best way to integrate efficiency, uh, the concepts of SDGs in our curriculum amid the restrictions of that immersion of the, in our community? Um, as a, this, okay. Uh, can, can, can the person explain more on the question? Uh, good afternoon. Yes, please. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, when it comes to the uh, sustainable development goals, it is very important that we present to our students their appreciation on what will be their future contributions and even uh, consider it as, as a way on how we will let them appreciate about their contributions in the future in the sustainable development goals. In our situation now, we can't, have their immersion for them to greatly appreciate the components of the SDGs in our communities due to our restrictions. So what could be the best way on how we will integrate these concepts in our curriculum? Exactly. Okay. I understood the question now and I will explain you just by one uh, example. So for example, traditionally, you know, when we are teaching geography, we, we are talking about uh, different topography or uh, some uh, strategic location. And uh, you, you talk about that land, you talk about the forest, you talk about rivers, but these all things you talk separately, okay? But we need to bring into the integration of all these things and as a case study. So for example, if we are talking now about just one, I'm talking about Thames. And I must, like Thames in England, that is correct. In geography, we will talk about that Thames is in England. There is a population there and uh, there is some navigation parts, some, all those physical uh, and uh, uh, like uh, physical geographical things we will talk. But we must also talk about 
its chemical properties, its uh, biological, uh, you know, uh, uh, things, interaction with nature, how much uh, resources are available there to uh, support the population which is growing on Thames. Like, and that is how if you go on integrating different disciplines within that part or within that case study, then you will be able to bring a comprehensive picture and how uh, uh, you will be able to impact all those factors by applying your knowledge. And that is what we want in, a, in any curriculum. And for example, if it is nursing, they are already doing some job towards health. Now, how they can facilitate that service of health to decrease poverty by uh, to decrease unemployment, to decrease uh, or, or to decrease the waste, to decrease uh, impact on uh, water. These all things, if that is integrated in your curriculum, then that will allow you your curriculum to touch on SDGs. I hope you understand what I mean. Yes, ma'am. I truly agree that interdisciplinary approach will greatly appreciate the concepts and presentation of SDG. Thank you very much. Yes. And, uh, and when you are developing your curriculum, you must bring in stakeholder engagement. You must engage with your own teachers and own uh, developers to understand and the users as well that what they do not understand, how they are going to understand the theories and developers, how they are going to put the theories forward. So if, if beforehand some consultations are carried out, you will be able to develop a comprehensive pro, a program to, for a delivery. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Renuka. Let me just read one last question. Uh, I'd like to apologize. I, I still have lots of questions here, but I will just consolidate and send this to our speakers later. But this is from uh, Miguel Carpio of JRU. Can you please comment about the precautionary principle, which simply states if we are not sure of the anthropogenic impact or impacts of certain actions on the environment, then we should refrain from undertaking or conducting said action. How does this affect businesses? Can I go Thank first, you. Dr. Renato? Yes, yes, please. Yes. Yeah, I, I have a vested interest in this question because I used to work in the biofuels industry, still do. Uh, and the biofuels industry is rampant for land use. Huh? And uh, we are much criticized, we were much criticized by the environmentalists for trying to uh, deforest a lot of land to produce biofuels for mass consumption. Uh, and part of it was, first of all, to deal with uh, edible oil. Uh, this is the, you know, the, the road to Rome is uh, always <laughs> paved with good intentions. Uh, road to hell is paved with good intentions. Sorry, that's the other word. Uh, we have this thing about unintended consequences happening. And uh, in climate change, it's always the case. Uh, biofuels is one. If you embark on growth of biofuels indiscriminately, you'll be using a lot of land, unproductive land maybe, but there'll be a lot of impact. And they have framed it in such a way that you have uh, to, to categorize the land use change impact of your uh, particular operation. It's a precautionary principle that you need to make this assessment. And if it is negative, you do not embark on that project. Uh, as far as projects go, as far as standards go, they will not encourage it. As far as governance go, they will not encourage it if there's a negative impact on the environment. Then with regard to technology, uh, there are a lot of technologies that are now inserted uh, for climate change mitigation. Uh, for example, solar energy. And solar energy, you have a lot of uh, uh, panels. I think they've been in place for decades now, one or two decades. And then we have to deal with the uh, used solar panels. What do you do when solar panels have run out of their, of their lifespan? And, and, and so you have a huge waste problem. So this is another unintended consequence. Uh, what do you do with this? So this is the kind of accounting you need to take place. The second is lithium ion batteries batteries that come with uh, using electric vehicles and, uh, and so on and so forth. And even if you want to use uh, electric vehicles or greater electrification, you're going to see where the electricity is coming from, whether you increase coal-based sources as a result, you use more fossil fuel instead, and, and so on and so forth. Those are very clear-cut examples and there are many, many more. 
So precautionary principle is an absolute must. Uh, I think it should be embedded into system thinking because one part of the system, if you do not watch it, uh, will affect the other part. <laughs> and you need to actually make sure that the holistic view is taken into account. Maybe Dr. Renuka, you may have something to say and add. And uh, no, I think you are. You have done the best, best uh, your efforts. So absolutely agree with you. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you, Mr. Miguel, for that question. Thank you, Mr. Ku and uh, Dr. Renuka for answering. Uh, again, uh, we, we will be consolidating the questions. I still have lots of questions in my <laughs> direct message, but we'll ask uh, our participants about these later. So we have a lot more reason to attend the succeeding sessions because it has been a very informative discussion with Dr. Renuka and Mr. Ku. If you could recall earlier, uh, Dr. Franz also introduced Dr. Joss Yusin, but uh, he will be joining us in the next uh, sessions. So once again, I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Uh, Renuka and Mr. Ku. Also, thank you to the participants or to everyone who participated in the open forum. But before we end this uh, session, let me inform you that there is an evaluation of this webinar. The link to the evaluation form is sent in the chat. So please uh, click the link and then accomplish this form immediately no? so you won't uh, forget. So how will you be able to get your certificate of participation in this webinar series? E-certificates will be directly emailed to the participants. Please answer the evaluation before the end of the program, and only those who completed the six sessions will be given a certificate of participation in Shaping Sustainable Futures Together series. Again, thank you, everyone. And now we shall listen to the closing remarks. But, but uh, before the closing remarks, shall we post the dates of the next uh, sessions? So we are just uh, almost finished with the first session. We have five more. Okay. So for the first session, it's Introduction to Sustainability. The second session is on December 17, 2021, Systems Thinking and Problem Analysis. Session three is on yeah. January 14. Uh, session four is February 18. Uh, session five is on March 18. And session six is on April 15. So please take note of the dates. Uh, this will run, uh, this will be from 3.30 in the afternoon, Philippine time, and 7.30 uh, in uh, English time. So ito po ang, these are our themes, so systems thinking and problem analysis, the meaning and impact of SDGs, sustainability leadership, global sustainability and corporate social responsibility, and leading sustainable transformation. So we'll see you in the coming sessions. But for now, we shall listen to the closing remarks of the Vice President for Academic Affairs and the Dean of the School of Graduate Studies of the Baliwag University here in the Philippines. Let us all welcome Dr. Flor Deliza A. Castro. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ramadan. So in behalf of our President and the entire Baliwag community, we'd like to express our appreciation to the delivery team of the Shaping Sustainable Futures Together series. We'd like to also say thank you to Global Sustainability Futures, the University College of Estate Management, Maastricht University, and the Opeduka Project. So we have learned a lot uh, from the talks of Dr. Renupa and Professor Ku, and I'm sure that in the next sessions that we'll be having, as mentioned by Dr. Ramadan, we will be getting more information about sustainability development, particularly the targets no, and the goals that we have to achieve by 2030. So I was listening to the talk of Dr. Renuka, and she gave a lot of emphasis on climate change the human influence on the changes that are happening now in the planet, coral breaching and the release of carbon emission. If you are on the business side naman, then you probably were enlightened by the talk of Professor Ku regarding the perspective 
on business about sustainability impact, particularly on uh, business in system boundary. So I'd like to reiterate our thanks to everyone who came today. There will be more and we will have five more sessions every third Friday of the month. And I'd like to repeat no, the topics that we will have for the second webinar. We'll have systems thinking and problem analysis. Third webinar, the meaning and the impact of SDGs. Fourth webinar, sustainability leadership. Fifth webinar, global sustainability and corporate social responsibility. And the last one is leading sustainable transformation. So there are so many changes happening now in the world. And I think the roles that we will be playing as citizens no, and as global citizens in the realization of the Sustainable Development Goals 2030 will be attained if we are going to work together, whatever our field or specialization is or discipline is, if we are going to share our resources together, and if we are going to respond together with our vision of attaining sustainability as the key for a better future. In closing, again, we'd like to say thank you to everyone. We'd like to say thank you to our president, Dr. Lagunda, no, for spearheading this international webinar on sustainable development goals, to Dr. Renuka, to Professor Ku, and we would like to see you on the third Friday of every month up to next year of 2022. So as we say it here in Baliwag University, Maraming salamat, and the tagline of the university is, let's be the best we can be. We are now 96 years old. We are very near in our centennial celebration as a higher education institution. Again, as you say it in the Philippines, maraming salamat po. At uh, mabuhay tayo lahat. Thank you, Dr. Ram. Thank you very much, Dr. Flor de Liza A. Castro. Uh, and that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes the first session of this series. Again, our gratitude to the visiting fellows for Ramadan. global sustainability. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Pat. Uh, let's take this opportunity to have our group shot, group photo. Please turn your webcams on, dear participants, so that you can be part of this uh, historical <laughs> photo. The first of the sessions. Okay. So I'll count. Uh, one, two, three. Smile, everyone. Next uh, frame. Again. Ah. Okay, one more time. Smile, everyone. One, two, three. Okay, second frame. Uh, be ready. Uh, smile, everyone. Again. One, two, three, smile. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm sorry, Rav. I'm taking the picture. So third frame in my screen. Everyone, please open your cameras. One, two, three, smile. Or if you want to, for example, award them. And because you think that those... Oh, uh, Kylie, stay on mute first. Thank you. Okay, third. Uh, fourth frame in my screen classmates one two three style and then okay wait for a while and then fifth frame the last frame so one two three smile all right let me just save it uh that's good thank you very Back much to you, sir. thank you mom reina uh, again thank you to our visiting fellows for global sustainability and of course you our dear participants uh, we hope to see more of you in the coming sessions. Please enjoin your colleagues to participate in the succeeding sessions. We would also like to thank our partners, Global Sustainable Futures, University College of Estate Management, Maastricht University, and the Opeduca Project. This is Ramadan De Jesus saying thank you and have a great day, everyone. See you in the next sessions. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Pat. Bye.
Thank you, Dr. Cordelisa. Thank you. Congratulations. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good evening, Dr. Laos. Good evening po, Dr. Cordelisa. Long time no see. I hope to see you. I really... Yes, I hope to see you soon. Thank you, Pat, for inviting us. And Dr. Hawk and uh, Dr. I forgot the name. <laughs> Very nice. Very good learning session. Bye bye. Yeah, bye. Bye. Thank you. We need to stop the recording. <laughs>